So Jochen, I think we can get started. It's uh, 6.02 and I would uh, very much like to welcome you to a very distinguished panel and discussion on German economic policy from black zero to green transformation. My name is Andrea Römmele. I am Dean of Executive Education at the Hertie School. And together with um, our friends and colleagues from the Open Society Foundations, we have um, launched a series of uh, panels, discussions, and events around the what we in Germany call the super election year uh, 2021. We not only have the national election in September, but a number of state elections. And this is what we want to tackle in this series. A couple of weeks ago, we had a very distinguished panel on foreign policy. And um, I'm very happy that today we have a round of very distinguished uh, uh, scholars and people and, and politicians around the table talking about German economic uh, uh, policy. Um, I'm also very happy that we were able to uh, draft this panel together with, uh, with Jochen Andritzky. Um, Jochen will be our moderator today and I would like to take a few minutes to introduce Jochen to you. Jochen Andritzky is a member of the Next Bretton Woods Group at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. He was the Secretary General of the German Council of Economic Experts from June 2015 to April 2018. He obtained degrees in economics and politics from the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland and following a visiting scholarship at the University of California uh, and here in my speaking notes it says UCSC and since I have also you know strong ties to California uh, I think this is Santa Cruz right Jochen? Uh, from UC uh, Santa Cruz. He completed his dissertation on debt crisis at the University of St. Gallen in, 20, uh, in, in 2006. Jochen, I want to thank you once again for really this wonderful work uh, you have put into this panel and for the great collaboration we have established in making this panel happen. And I would like to pass on the word and the floor to you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everybody. Nice to see you. Um, I'm going to be the moderator of this evening, and I just want to um, give a little introductory remark here. I think the background of today is, and it could be a better day, because just today, Bundestag is expected to pass the new climate law that mandates Germany to become climate neutral by 2045. I mean, it couldn't be a better timing of, of this event. So the interesting thing is um, all the main parties agree on the overall objective, but of course they differ in how to get there. Up to now, the German government also has achieved already quite a few achievements in this area. But these policies are criticized by some as doing not enough and by others as being too expensive or inefficient. So for instance, you know that the electricity surcharge under the renewable energy law has grown to 30 billion euros per year. That's about 1% of GDP. Or the recently negotiated exit from coal burning power plants is also estimated to run um, into public payments of about 80 billion euros. Moreover, tackling climate change cannot be done by Germany alone. And it is not the only challenge that Germany faces. So today, this comes at a time when the pandemic has, has caused turmoil in some sectors of the economy public debt has increased by 10% of GDP. And um, probably with the, with the debt break um, back in force from 2023, consolidation is around the corner. In addition, by the mid of this decade, the baby boomers will start to retire in larger numbers, putting pressure on the pension system and aggravating the shortage of qualified workers. So it is against this kind of broader background that um, we would like to discuss the appropriate economic and fiscal policies um, for the next, um, for the election and, and, and of course beyond. So in the next one and a half hours, we'll try and have a constructive debate that will help you 
um, our international audience to understand better where Germany is heading. I'm really grateful to have such a distinguished panel to discuss that with. Um, it is not easy to bring together a panel at this time. So really thank you very much for all being here. And we've tried to combine experts with policymakers um, to have a very informed discussion. And I will now um, introduce the panel before we kick off. Let me first introduce our experts. Um, Professor Ottmar Edenhofer is director at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and director of the Mercator Research Institute. He's one of the go-to experts for climate research in Germany. Um, I can recommend his book, Climate Policy, um, where he dissects, he and his course are dissects the trade-offs involved. Welcome very much, Otmar. We have Maya Goethe, who I think these days hardly needs an introduction. She is director of research at the new institute in Hamburg, a new interdisciplinary think tank. And her book, which I also have at hand, I think you need to write a book to be on this panel here. Um, her book, um, Unsere Welt Neu Denken, has been a, a bestseller here in Germany. She's also honorary professor at the Eufana University in Lüneburg and a member of the Club of Rome. Welcome, Maya. Glad you can be here. I also welcome Caroline Schenwit. Caroline is Managing Director of the Forum Ökologisch Soziale Marktwirtschaft, internationally also known as Green Budget Germany. Before this assignment, Caroline has been working in the renewable energy sector for a long time. Welcome, Caroline. Um, our policymakers here are, let me first welcome Wolfgang Schmidt. Wolfgang is State Secretary at the German Ministry of Finance and has been working with Finance Minister Olaf Scholz for many, many years. And now, Wolfgang, you love to discuss economics and in turn your participation facilitated that many others came on board because they all love to discuss with you. Um, so Wolfgang will wear two hats today. He's first an active policymaker and can tell us about the hands-on issues in, in policymaking in the ministry, but he will also wear the hat of the SPD, the Social Democrat Party, which is part of the current government coalition. Next, let me welcome Lisa Paus from Bündnis 90 The Greens, the party which has become the runner-up in current polls. Lisa is member of the German parliament since 2009, and she's a Green Party speaker on fiscal policy in the parliament. Lisa's field spe of specialization is tax policy, and she stands for more social justice and greater support, particularly for the less well-off. Welcome to our panel, Lisa. Kai Whitaker entered the German parliament in 2013 at age 28. He is from the CDU-CSU parliamentary group, which is part of the current coalition. Kai is, uh, is the party's representative at the Parliamentary Advisory Council for Sustainable Development. And Kai you recently argued in parliament that carbon pricing is too uneven as a result of six different types of taxes applied. Welcome, Kai. Otto Fricke is also a member of the German parliament and speaker for fiscal policy of the FDP, the Liberal Party. A lawyer by training, Otto stands for, if I, if I translate your, your quote correctly, for politics which can do the math. I try to translate. His ambition is to hand over a sustainable world to the next generation without a mountain of debt. Welcome to the discussion, Otto. Now, as I said in the beginning, Bundestag may just in these minutes vote on the climate law. So it's a bit unclear when this will take place, but our, our panelists which are, who are member of the parliament might have to drop out for um, casting their vote. It might be at seven o'clock before or after, we will, we will only know. So um, the panel might be reduced uh, by a couple of, um, of panelists um, for, for, for a moment. So we will just have to ca carry on. Um, so now, during our event, um, you, my dear audience, um, you can pitch in with your questions. Please send your questions to us through the Q&A button on your screen. I will then try and pick up as, as many as possible and weave them into our discussion. Note this, this event is on the record. It is also recorded and will be available later for watching on the Herty YouTube channel. With that, let's kick off the discussion. And I first wanted to invite um, each of the panelists, starting with the experts, for, for a short statement. And I wanted to start with, with Otma and ask him, so economic theory suggests that carbon pricing is kind of the most efficient uh, mechanism to, to reduce emissions. 
But what can you share from your from your academic work? How high a carbon price do we have to expect in Germany? And besides that, I guess there is a, like a public investment necessary. What what are they, what what kind of magnitudes are we talking about here? Over to Otmar. Yeah, Jochen, thanks thanks for the invitation. Now. Um, As you can imagine, uh, the, the answer to your very simple question is, is a complicated one. Because uh, in Germany, we have, on the one hand, electricity and industry is under the cap of the European Emissions Trading Scheme. And here, the carbon price is around 50 euros per ton CO2. And given the fact that we expect uh, uh, the new the European Green Deal, I would guess that uh, in this European emission trading scheme, the price will climb to, in the next few years, uh, between 80, 90, even 100 euros per ton CO2. And we will see in Germany and Europe a much more rapid phase out of coal than anticipated, for example, by the Coal Commission. Then we have a second system, which is called our national um, uh, national. Uh, uh, emission trading scheme, which is an upstream scheme, which uh, basically regulates coal, oil, and gas. Uh, and, and, and in this system, I expect the carbon price, uh, let's say, um, after 2025, a carbon price in the order of magnitude, let's say, about uh, 100 to 150 euros per ton CO2. Why, where, where, this, where does this uh, uh, calculation come from? It's simply due to the fact that we have decided to reduce the, uh, to reduce the emissions by 2030, 2040, and 2045 in a way uh, which allows us to achieve uh, greenhouse gas neutrality by in, in, in 2045. So this is the order of magnitude. Of course, there's a huge uncertainty about this because we do not know exactly all the technologies in the heating sector and the transport sector and in, 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 the, in the building sector. However, um, you said that carbon pricing is the most efficient way and uh, economists are normally uh, accused that they have an obsession with efficiency. Uh, you might say, okay, we do not care about efficiency, but still, if you do not implement the carbon price, for example, if you allow the carbon price to be free after 2025, you can do it with complementary measures like performance standards, But the marginal abatement costs will not uh, disappear. Uh, there, will, there will remain the question is, are these uh, costs transparent through a carbon price or are they hidden by other complementary measures? Now, yeah. the, your second question, and then I, I stop, is what is the, 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 the revenue uh, uh, power of, of the carbon price? This can also be answered. So uh, dependent on the trajectory, but if you have a trajectory which ends up with 150 euros per ton CO2 in 2030. So you end up in 2030 with an annual revenues of 25 uh, uh, a billion euros in, 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 in Germany. If it is higher, it could even climb uh, um, uh, 40 billion euros uh, per ton CO2, which is a, a significant amount. And then the question is how this revenues will be used either for public infrastructure investments or for social compensation, or for subsidies. This is something which we have to discuss uh, uh, in this panel. So, so 25 to 40 billion, that's again like uh, one, one and a half percent of GDP, uh, measured as percent of today's, today's GDP. That doesn't sound, uh, you know, from, a, from an economist point of view, not very big. Maya, therefore, do you think, I mean, you specialize in transformative processes in general, but can you talk a little bit to, whether these incentives are basically enough for the corporate sector, the industries to basically switch, switch in many cases, their business model, their products um, to help achieve this because uh, it's, we're not a state-directed state economy. No, thank you very much. Um, and Otmar, thank you so much for doing all this work of explaining the public <laughs> about pricing. And I think the point that you make is so important to understand that we're trying to correct against a market failure. And this is why I think it is so important to never speak about the costs of changing without talking about the costs of not changing. And this is where the discourse still is a bit lopsided. And I think it's been very helpful that in recent studies on the 13 billion of damage, for example, of 
procrastination of climate action. It is talked about as hidden subsidies that we have in place right now because the markets are not indicating the shortage, uh, shortage of the resource of the atmosphere. So when we're talking about costs, it's really, really important to talk about the already occurring costs that we're simply not putting on the balance sheets. And then balance sheets is my second word because I found it really encouraging to see how much from the world of the economy, so entrepreneurs and different companies are already anticipating to be having to because of new EU uh, reporting directives, for example, on sustainability, but also wanting to up the transparency that Otma also talked about. So the climate risk is just the first one. And then we're talking about wider ranges of sustainability reporting. And there was just a recent uh, study that we've done with the banking union and then with OMFIF, um, how companies 250 and beyond employees in Germany are anticipating this and it was really encouraging to see that they're actually wanting the kind of directives on reporting and the two cost accounting coming from it a because of the transparency reasons for them to have a possibility if they're moving ahead faster than others to have that as a beneficial thing so we're talking about a top runner principle that could be emerging from this and to also be able to avoid stranded assets because when you start reporting on risks that currently are hidden, then you can also obviously talk to the finance side and say, look, this is something we have to avoid. We have to put back money. We have to change our supply chains, which currently isn't possible. So many of the companies that would like to move ahead faster are finding it difficult under current financial considerations and risk calculations really do this before the damage is very close to their door. So if you want to have anticipatory and quick changes of supply chains and um, bringing out the technologies of products, the things that then make a carbon price less bad, especially for the consumers, we really have to talk about how we basically calculate all, all levels. So how the macroeconomic have the accounting in the firms and look at the financial sector at the same time. Then we have a systems change yeah. so that we are percolating what we treasure in terms of what we measure through all the different ways of balancing where we are going. That's, that's very nicely said. Um, but another very interesting um, point we need to take up in the discussion, and I wanted Colin to pitch, pitch in here, is um, since we have this international audience here, so the question will obviously be, so the German companies do that, the German, uh, we, we price carbon, what does it all mean for German business partners, for German suppliers, for German export markets? I mean, um, what, what what do we need to, I mean, what will change for them and how do we need to deal with that in the international context? Caroline, can you enlighten us to that? Well, I try. <laughs> um, so, well, I think that uh, it is still um, underestimated uh, what amount of transformation we will need in supply chains worldwide if we want to really go for effective climate protection. And the key question is, will politics follow up with measures, with measures or, uh, in order to realize those uh, protect, protection goals? And um, uh, I think when we look at the supply chains, I would like to, to pick up the transparency um, uh, aspect and also underline it with feasibility, because I think the, uh, the, the power and um, uh, the sheer force of uh, uh, the systems already in place is, is being underestimated heavily by, by regulators. So they, I think there's a lot of capability already there and a lot of potential when we look to further digitization. So uh, that politics really has to realize the, the, the potential of those technologies around and how much they can bring uh, uh, to, to, the, um, to the game in, in, in terms of viable uh, measure, measuring of emission footprints uh, of raw materials and products and the real credibility of the entire system. Um, because what is also relevant in, in trade, so trust is the most valuable currency in trade. And that's why we need this credibility. We need a good and functional system. And uh, that includes, in my opinion, uh, a carbon border adjustment mechanism, the way it is being discussed right now, or maybe uh, uh, in a, in a, in a um, slightly adjusted manner. But this is a very important signal to demonstrate uh, uh, the seriousness, seriousness of climate protection intentions, and also to provide a dynamic to the, um, uh, to the game. So there is, there is no 100% certainty that uh, what we do will exactly provide uh, to the goals because those are complex uh, um, interactions. But I think uh, what we can do uh, 
in cooperation with our uh, business partners is to act credible and consistent, lead by example, and design fair mechanisms also uh, in terms of compensation for countries who cannot yet uh, uh, bridge the gap between their development uh, dilemma and uh, lack of investment power uh, 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 and uh, having troubles to, to bring their uh, uh, emission footprint down. So I, I, I see the uh, carbon border adjustment system as a kind of a touchstone for this whole process. Uh, and it could, I think it could also be a blueprint for similar uh, scarcity uh, pricing systems, for example, regarding resources or circular, uh, uh, circularity requirements. There's still a lot of transformatory potential to be uh, unleashed. And uh, I think that uh, that would be a very good and helpful first step. So, so maybe just, just to explain, I mean, the, the carbon border adjustment is all about that those polluting activities simply don't relocate from Germany to other countries. Um, therefore, um, at the border, there would be um, um, a levy on, on imports of, of polluting um, materials like steel um, and vice versa. The, um, the exporter and exporters might get you know, something out from the, from the emissions um, charges they incur here to remain competitive. So with that, let me um, go over to the policymakers and um, talk, ask Wolfgang first. I mean, the green transformation that sounds like, and, and the experts have already made cl clear that, be the greatest transformation since industrial age. So we, can, we are now at a time when um, Germany's economy is running at full steam, employment is uh, the highest ever. And despite all that, we fear that the social fabric seems fragile. And therefore my question is, can the German economy and also the German voters, are they really ready and able to pull this off in your view? Well, the short answer, Jochen, would be yes. Um, but I think it's right, as you, as you said, this is the greatest transformation since the industrial age. And just to put it in perspective, we've burned oil and gas and coal for the last 250 years to make our industry uh, work. Um, and I guess we want to um, continue to be an industrial society with manufacturing and things happening in Germany. And now we have less than 25 years to become net zero. And that is indeed a huge endeavor. And so my feeling is that both society and um, enterprises, but also politics is ready. And I think um, by now everybody understood the challenge. Um, so we are in a different position than let's say four years ago. I think Fridays for Future played a crucial role, but if you look at the different programs, the manifestos for the election, you will find it with one exception, I guess, in every manifesto that climate change is probably the most important challenge. So the question is not if, but the question is now how. And I think there starts the difference. And that's also the interesting discussion that we should have. How do we make it feasible? And as you mentioned, the question um, of, of the, the, the social fabric that seems fragile, this is indeed the question. How do we make sure that people do not feel excluded? And that should not be... Um, an excuse for, for, for not acting, but it should be the, 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 the clear task for us at hand to make sure that we can get all the people along. And, and we talked about the industries, but obviously it's also about people. And, and we saw in the US what happens if you don't include um, a majority of people, then you have a backlash. And I, I can just tell you from, from the, the previous three years or four years with the Trump administration at every G20 meeting, we had to fight to even include the, the language that climate change exists. And it was difficult at all levels to come to agreements with them. And then the others started disappearing from the consensus that climate change is happening. So now we are obviously all ha very happy that, that, that Biden is there and that, that there is a new cooperation. Um, but I think this shows us how fragile this indeed is. And so um, I think that is the interesting question on how to make it happen. Yeah, I mean, however, 
I mean, I just allude back to the um, to the difficult negotiation about the phasing out of, of coal industry, and I want to therefore play the ball to to Kai here. And I, I think this is an example of which shows how tricky politics can become in practice. And can you share your view as to how how to 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 tackle this this trade off between the green transformation and economic interests um what what do you think what what is your 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 way you propose here well it, it really depends how you look at this transformation i mean of course there are political differences among the parties also represented on this board and it doesn't come as a surprise if, if i tell you that there's only a trade-off in classical terms if you believe in some sort of conventional green policy, i.e. Uh, bans, orders, abstinence, regulation, and so on, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and therefore, I think it was a fresh um, a fresh move from, from our um, Chancellor candidate, Laschet, um, to say, we as Germans want to be the first climate neutral industrial economy in the world. Both words, climate neutral and industrial economy, are equally important. And that is a true, um, a true sustainable view, actually, uh, on, on policies. We must look at all three aspects of the economy, of social issues and of ecological issues um, to, to, to get together, to bring everyone on, at the table to find uh, sustainable solutions. To be practical, I mean, I must sell my voters alone in my constituency, 30,000 people working in the in the car industry alone that this transformation will benefit them and they are asking not only if they have a job tomorrow but also if they can pay their bills and pay for their for, for the kids and, and 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 finance their their mortgage and stuff like that that is also an important question and um the, the key solution to that is that we as Germans, we need to make, we, we have to transform the question on climate change or the battle on climate change into a kind of business case. I mean, we are a technology driven economy. We are an export driven economy. If we can create the, the technology of the future to, to, to fight climate change and be able to export it to all other nations, we will be much quicker in achieving a climate neutral world. And that is uh, the ultimate goal we have. Yeah, that, that will be interesting. I, I hope we can we can deepen that as the discussion goes. Um, but let's first stick a little bit to the to the question how how we go about to 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 set the, set the incentives and they wanted to bring in Lisa. So I think, I mean, your party has been campaigning on the topic for a long while. And I think um, the approach chosen by the Greens is basically characterized by both market mechanisms, emissions, I mean, carbon pricing, and also regulatory approaches. So the, the question that, uh, that people ask, or particularly economists always ask is, how, how, what's, what's your view? How can policymakers ensure that there's consistency of the entire package? So a sectoral approach, that create path dependencies um, that might need to be adjusted and therefore like also um, changing the incentives for the industry to, to invest in, and change. How do you, do you, don't you see that as a trade-off or what's your mechanism, how to ensure that the package overall is consistent? Well, the first problem we do have is that uh, we lost um, a lot, a lot of time during the last 10 years. And so uh, actually the truth is that we did not really change our program so much, but uh, that is now no, even it seems to some, some people even harder because we have to do the same things within a shorter period of time. And, um, and the big challenge for the economy and of course for the German industry is that, um, that, um, that, we, that we now have these the sort of, of path, path inconsistencies that we have a great insecurity for all of the industry. If you just know that, for example, the, the DAX uh, 30 um, enterprises in Germany, that if you look at them uh, and look at their ecological footprint, uh, no, you know that they are right now at a, at a five degree path. And that 
kind of shows you know, what, what the different path has to be and what big disruption and what big you know, a challenge you have and what big uh, insecurity to these new markets. And um, Kai Whittaker just said, we want to be uh, the, the avant-garde industry uh, we used to be you know, during the last uh, 40, 50, 60 years. But the truth is that, for example, our autom automobile, automobile industry he just mentioned you know, uh, is now in trouble because they are right behind. And we know that uh, innovation circles um, within uh, automo the automobile industry, for example, takes at least five years you know, Till um, you can, you come to your next um, uh, next um, uh, car type, and this is the challenge we have, uh, and um, this is the responsibility the state has that we need to reduce the insecurity we now have um, because of this big goal, and that uh, it's very important that uh, the that the that the government that the policies now produce security to the markets that we have a rather clear idea for the next 10 years how we can make the turnaround and that is i think the the the, the, the main objective we have to go for and that means of course that we do have uh, um, adjust on the way of course uh, uh, again but still the, the the main thing is that we clearly say um, for example how do we do with the co2 price um, and the CO2 price alone, no? uh, in the, at least in our logic, is not the only thing, but we also have to adjust in the regulation. Um, we also have to adjust in the energy sector. And we also have to adjust, of course, the, the public infrastructure, because every economist knows that, uh, that the price is, um, is uh, uh, central, of course, for the market, but um, the, 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 the infrastructure, infrastructure uh, no? and the, the, the possibility to have opportunities um, is also very important and therefore price, the, the price signal itself uh, is not enough, but you also have to adjust also the regulation and you have to adjust also the, the public infrastructure to make, to, to, to make it possible for the people, for example, to change no? from the automobile to public uh, transportation or to change from the uh, um, um, diesel automobile to an emission-free automobile or so, or so on. So these things have to be put together. And therefore we say, um, let's do it together. Let's say clearly the CO2 path. Let's say clearly something about the, the price mechanism. We uh, commit ourselves that we in, invest in public infrastructure therefore want to change to reform the, uh, the, the, the debt break in Germany and put more 50... We're gonna come to that. Okay, come to that in, in this past. And, uh, and of course, we are clear um, in, in, towards the social compensation because we want to do it together with the people in a democracy. And therefore, of course, it's necessary that you, that you have for the whole process the, the majority and the people on board and therefore social compensation yeah. is decisive and we want to give back the money with uh, completely as a energy money per hub per capita yeah yeah these i think i wanted to direct a question to otto but basically i think you already gave enough stuff for him to comment on because the fdp has put um uh, emissions pricing or emissions trading at the center of the instruments and that of course begs the question i mean how do you deal with volatile prices do they give the right signals do they give sufficient a signal for companies for instance to to invest i mean these are very long-term investments and they need some um some some clear path where this is going and uh, so what, what how can you make sure that the emissions trading is achieving the same as, uh, you know, a combined approach with regulatory freebates? I mean, all these other instruments. Yeah, but that, when you're asking that question, you do say that the other way it doesn't wouldn't have the same problem. If you do a regulation where at the end you have companies going away from Germany and don't follow the reduction of carbon dioxide, it doesn't make sense. So you could ask this for every kind of way you do, except, of course, if you say every company has to stay where it is and has to do things where they are, you have that problem everywhere. And I absolutely do disagree with Lisa that there has to be a, an absolute security for companies. Market economy, to my mind, means be sure where the highway is leading to, but don't be sure it's a straight highway. 
because otherwise you just go for speed and you don't go for the really necessary things, just to make this clear in the picture. So what I do think is necessary, and that is why I think a market system at the end is the best solution, to have a competition, to think about how can we do it better, not to rely on what's well, going to be the same pass. And the next one is, what if we find out that we probably in future have to reduce even, even in, in a larger amount, and we might have the possibility that we have solutions for that, do we then still say, yeah, well, but the regulation said this is the way it's going to be? No, I, I don't agree on that. Our goal has to be reduce what, we're, we're, what we have done in, in the past, whatever pollution we've done in the past. And this as fast as possible, but on the other side, as efficient as possible. Second one, and that is, very, that is to my mind very important. Um, if companies in industry have the feeling they are quite secure, they know what is going on, they will follow that path and they will not invest. You could see that with, with, the, with the automobile industry. And I, again, disagree with Lisa that they are way behind. They were way behind. Why were they way behind? Because whoever was in government in the past years gave them the feeling that they don't have to change, that they were sure of what is going to happen. Because there was no market on how much do I pollute. That, that was not existing might be reduced by the question of the price of fuel, but that's it. And when we, when we accept, and I totally agree with Wolfgang, politics is side of one party we don't talk about, at least if we all read our Harry Potter and do know what that means, have accepted that things are the way they are and that we have to do, that we have to do it faster than, than we ever thought and probably even faster when we get other information. So what is at the end the best solution? Be better than others by fearing that others could be better than you and have more ideas. And this is at least what made this country great. And, and last one, and that is for me important. Yes, we have to take the people with us. And that does mean on the one hand side, as politics, you always have to go a step ahead. But if you're too far ahead, you're outside of the frame and nobody is seeing what you're doing. And, and so here it is really important that communication in the future shows that, that we don't lose. And, and here I completely agree with, with Kai. And again then, don't be sure, don't take everything for granted. You know you have to develop and that you have to invest. And that might, is my last information. Transformation only works with investment. And many people think, yeah, it's the public sector that is going to invest. They forget that 80% of the investments in Germany are made by the private sector. So what we have to do is we have to force the private sector to invest. Yes, the public sector is necessary because it gives us the framework. If we don't have the framework, we don't have the trust. And that is at least what I do think is necessary because if you want to double the private investment, well, you have to, what, Wolfgang, 16 times as much uh, public investment that is necessary. So let's, let's, uh, let's open the discussion. And I thought we do in, um, in, in, on three topics. And the one topic would be to stay a little bit with fiscal policy. So we heard already a lot about that. So we, we, Otmar gave us an impression of where the carbon price could be. So 100, 150 and 180 euros. That might translate, or let me translate that into a liter of, of, of gasoline price of, that would be about 40, 40 cent more. Um, so that we heard that it generates another 30 billion or so. Lisa says this should be returned. Um, and I think the other parties have similar plans. But at the same time, I mean, if we switch off coal power plants, if we switch off nuclear power, if we change the infrastructure to more, uh, let's say, trains, less roads and so on, there's going to be a lot of investment needs down the road. Now, please combine that with the expected higher costs from aging. We're already now paying about 100 billion per year into the pension system and, and um, all the other structural changes that we need, digitalization and so on, that we need to, to keep ahead. How do we do that within the massively shrunk envelope after the pandemic um, within, within our uh, fiscal framework and within the solid uh, state finances that uh, is, is, I think, a trademark of, of Germany. Maybe I can invite Lisa to kick this off and, and others then to pitch in as they see fit. Well, as I tried to say already, um, um, we say we do have to change the, um, the debt rate. 
right now, you know, in Germany, we have the policy, we have the debt break, and um, um, we have a government that says not only the, the, we have to uh, fit in the debt break, but uh, also the, the black zero is the issue uh, to, um, to the world. And we say, um, well, the new black zero is the green zero. That means that the climate neutral neutrality should be the, should be the goal um, that also is the main issue for the for, for the uh, budget stability because um, when we go into this climate crisis and uh, do not adjust right now, then the costs in the future will be even higher and the costs will be more erratic even to the public sector. What we now had with COVID, no? that all of a sudden the, the, the state, the public has to put out billions and billions of euros. Uh, we will have that in shorter terms and shorter circles if we do not adjust right now. So that means we need an investment scheme right now for the next 10 years, not only in the public sector, but especially also in the public sector, because the public sector is not CO2 neutral at all. And it's very important for transportation. It's very important for the digitalization, no? which is also important also for renewables, for example, smart grids and so on, no? sector, uh, sector coupling, et cetera. And uh, therefore, uh, we really see a big impact also for the, for the public. And that means the reform of the German debt break and that we get a new investment rule within the German framework uh, as one important part to, to get into a consistent investment strategy towards CO, neutral, CO neutrality. Will it happen? Will it solve the problem, Wolfgang? Well, I think one needs to be a bit realistic as well. And I think, having been in politics now for over 20 years, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit tired of buzzwords and this idea of, of dream castles. Um, you need a two-third majority to change the debt break. And if you look at this podium, um, you could ask Otto and you could ask Kai whether his, their parties would accept that. And you not only need a two-third majority in the Bundestag, but you also need it in the Bundesrat, the second chamber. Um, and I don't see, probably in my lifetime, a majority, because just imagine even a, a green leadership of the next government and the CDU and the FDP in opposition. Where would you get the two-third majority? The same even if, if Olaf Scholz were to become chancellor and together with the Greens, Where's the two-third majority? So I think we should focus on what is possible and feasible and, and concentrate on these questions because otherwise it's an excuse not to do something. And, and so I think what we did, and if you look at the numbers, we increased investment to, to 50 billion a year. Actually this year's 60 billion because of COVID and next year probably as well. So for the next term up to 2025, it is 200 billion, it's 50% more of investment than in the previous term. And we all know that there is also a little problem of getting the money out. Otto is always torturing the government and asking us um, how much money is yet in the fund and why don't you spend it? And then we turn to the transportation minister and the energy minister and, and all the other ministers and ask them what is happening? Why don't you get the money out? It's there. And so I think we need to be more concrete and talk about planning rights and talk about um, obstacles. And you all know um, Baden-Württemberg, the role model of the green state, 12 windmills were built last year, 12. That is not enough. And it's not a question of money, I guess. The state is very rich and we have lots of subsidies and we have a lot of private investment. So there needs to be other obstacles. And my suggestion would be, let's focus on the real questions and not have a theoretical debate. We could have it all day long. And obviously we have some ideas on the, the constitutional debt break and, and, and output, con uh, output gaps and, 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 and. But that's not the thing that we need to discuss in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, but let's let's stick with fiscal policy and and policy that that can can do can do the math here. 
So I, I'm going to bring in a question from the panel. So one solution would be, of course, to acknowledge that this is very expensive and that also the carbon price might need to go higher. So if we had now a 300 euro uh, per ton carbon price, generates double the, double the revenue, of course, would that be something that would be acceptable? Um, who wants to take that? Kai, Otto? <laughs> Since Kai is leaving earlier, it's his turn. Well, I, to be honest, I, f I find it a strange debate to talk about what the right CO2 price is. I mean, if we really believe in the emission system, in this, in this, in this, um, yeah, in the system, in this cap system, which we already introduced on the EU level, it is up to the market to decide the right price. And therefore, customers will um, change their behavior and investors will change their investment and, and try to invest in such a way that they ha don't have to pay the price. So um, it, it, it's completely bongous, to be honest, to, to, to discuss the right CO2 price. Um, we should concentrate on bringing down carbon emission, and that is by capping it with certificates. But if I can relate to the, to the, to the debt question, first of all, I doubt that the state is the right or is the better investor? And just, just let me make one example here for my constituency, where the Green um, um, Traffic Minister of, of Baden-Württemberg um, invested the money we gave him four years ago uh, to put up an overhead um, uh, electric, electrical system for, um, uh, for, for, for lorries. Um, and there's only one company, one lorry company in Europe who uh, benefits from that. That's a Swedish company. And this track is right next to a Daimler uh, um, manufacturing site where 1,000 people are working. I, I wish the Greens would actually put their money where their mouth is. They are telling my people in my constituency, your jobs are not worth investing into it. They don't believe in the philosophy of Daimler, which is putting into, um, um, uh, into um, hydrogen energy, et cetera, et cetera. They don't believe in that. And we have fought that through Parliament once, uh, not only once, but twice and three times. The Greens do not, or were not convinced at the start, and they still are not uh, to, to the point. So and therefore, I think... I think we have to, um, to be careful at being the state, being the better investor. But also the Schuldenbremse, the debt break, allows some degree of debt. It doesn't say you can't have any debt. It says there is some degree of debt. Use it if you want to, but be careful with it. We cannot, if, if someone believes really that we can continue spending money like we did in the past two years, we will run in deep problems within a very short period of time. And then we won't be able to tackle this climate change uh, battle uh, because we have not the resources uh, to do so. And I find this is a very unsustainable policy, even not in line with what Karlsruhe said just two months uh, earlier, that we have to think also to the next, for the next generation and, uh, and uh, sustainable policy means therefore that we also have to take into account the financial sustainability. So let me just allow Lisa for a quick rebuttal here before bringing in Otmar and Maya. First, uh, I think we were told not just fight against the other parties. Okay. Uh, second is I did not really hear any positive um, um, help what you really do in this transformation thing. If you do, don't say uh, anything about the price, then say something about the, the, the quantities, then I can tell you the price. But uh, this is really, uh, really annoying that I, this is at least the third or fourth round I have with the, uh, with the colleagues from the Liberals and CDU, and they always say they are the, the real market player. And if you talk about them, no, how the market then should go, then you don't get any answers. So this is not really, this is not really helpful. Uh, the one thing I wanted to say is to this Daimler thing, because I also said in, in rounds with Daimler about the bus, uh, bus question and about the electricity, electric, electrification. And this really is a problem that Daimler was, was not ready to that. 
and was not willing to go in this uh, in this production. They still I, will, they still I, won't do that. I, 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 no, I can, and you don't I, invest in their technology. Why? I mean, the only do thing, you not the only trust thing them? I wanted to say is that the transport minister in Bad uh, Bad Wurtberg, of course is in contact with Daimler, was in contact with Daimler, and um, they are together working on the situation and uh, also transformation okay. of, of cars and buses. And if you now just want to tell something different than that, which is just a lie, I just have to- Okay, we, I need to refocus the discussion here because I mean, we want to stick with the big topics that are also interesting for, 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 our, for our audience. And therefore I want to bring I don't know which sequence it was now, Otmar or Maya, but uh, I want to hear your 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 views. Maya, Maya was situation. first. You're mute, Maya. No, I, thank you, because I I I'm coming from the point of view that we're really, really, really trying to put feasibility forward, really trying to see what can be measures that match multiple goals, and then to not artificially fabricate differences between different mechanisms in the election campaigns is I think helpful for also the wider public because there have been so many surveys now that said we just really want an idea how to move forward, we want transparency, we want accountability and we want clarity about it. And as soon as we think that it is a more equitable way that we're dealing with this solution, people are really willing to contribute. I think the most recent study I found impressive on this was from More in Common. And so the, the justice components and the feeling that everybody's doing their share are really, really crucial. And this is where I think we need to add to the pricing in itself to really think about the frameworks and to think creatively about it because we have a lot of, lot of steering impulses in the existing frameworks. So we don't only have to print new money, but we can reallocate in the 47 billion of uh, subsidies into dirty directions is one of them. We can look about at how do we insert for example, new KPIs, so key performance indicators into public R&D, into the research grants, into the modeling of economic performance. So in the, in the Advisory Council on Global Change, we called it the zero carbon mission. So you're really focusing on showing transparently the steering impulses from more than just the carbon tax. And um, I've been talking to tax advisors around this issue. If companies are then balancing transparently how many climate risks they have in there. So they're actually showing what is going or has to happen for them to become at least Paris compatible. And we've seen the case with Shell in front of the Dutch court. When they don't do the calculations right and then Shell does it or the court does it from a different angle, then they really run into trouble. And so how do we make this accountability and this race to the top something that they can rely on but not tell them how to do it obviously. And I think this is where we have to be really clear that you can't pick players. That's not at all ever the task of a state, but you have to be sure that you redefine the rules of the games so that we're really gearing towards that decarbonization, really adding in the circularity component. So when we're talking about an industrial base, a lot of the companies I talk to, they're very clear that this means moving away from stockpiling lots and lots and lots and lots of single products in every household into a total service orientation. That's where circularity and sharing economy exactly meet their hands into something where we also talk about a resource base that can work. And in all the EU proposals, unsurprisingly, the decarbonization and circularity go totally hand in hand, in particular in the high um, or difficult to abate sectors. So there, I do think if we only talk about pricing, A, without talking about what is currently subsidized, it's not helping. How do you correct against and really make sure the budget's already there is driving us in the right direction, so in the wrong direction. And to think more creatively about bringing different policy areas together so that we can have synergistic innovation models. I really think we're missing the pictures and we're just driving everybody crazy because we're putting single prices onto something that needs a much bigger, much more concerted way of looking at things and really aligning uh, sectoral policies well. Thank you, Maya. I think this is a great framing um, for the debate before we get lost in details. Um, Otmar, your intervention, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I would suggest that uh, we should a little bit separate the, the debate on, on the debt break uh, from, from the debate how to achieve carbon neutrality because I think it is not wise to, to mix them. Because my feeling is that 
uh, we, we, we need, it as an absolute necessity, we have to fix the pricing schemes. So I, 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 I would argue for that very, very strongly. I'm not saying uh, other measures are not important, in particular performance standards and such kind of things. But I would like to remind us, we had a, a decade where we relied very much on performance standards. And what we have seen in the transport sector, emissions still rising. That's a matter of fact. And therefore, I think we need, we need a, 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 consistent, a consistent framework. And here I would like to, to, to share a, a little bit so this, this issue about emissions trading and pricing because these things are mixed up. So I, I believe that in, at the 14th of July, when the European Commission will come up with a proposal, we will see at the European scale two emission trading schemes. One uh, for the power sector and one for industry, and the other one for transport, building, heating, and partially for agriculture. So th this is at least. So I think we will see two emission trading schemes. Why is this the case? It is the case because there are basically no people who would support a unified emission trading scheme because what would be the implication? The implication would be that power and industry would have to reduce emissions by 80% and the other sectors around 30% because of the different marginal abatement costs. So this is, uh, for, for the industry sector, almost not acceptable. So therefore, the only way to say, okay, we, we have to separate the, the sectors and we have to accept a different prices in the two sectors. The only way I see is a productive discussion at the national scale and at the European scale to think about over time a convergence of the two systems. But these two systems are, are absolutely important. And my feeling is that we are, when, when, one, when, when one proponent says we need prices, then the second says, opponent says, yeah, yeah, pricing are good, but we need other things. Let's, let's think about the overall framework. I'm not saying prices alone, but prices are absolutely essential. Prices have the potential to mobilize also the private capital. And I'm not saying there is no need for public infrastructure. It is. It is, in, it is very important to think about competitiveness. But let me, uh, let me share one important aspect. It seems to me this is quite important. Competitive is important, public investment. But the most important thing seems to me in this new energy when is social just the social justice issue. And I tell you why. Because the sectors, transport, heating, building, here, not the industry, but the consumer have to pay, have to, to, to bear the burden, the main burden. And therefore, it is quite clear that the, the low-income households will have to pay an overproportional high price. And when the price are climbing, this issue becomes even more important. And here I would like to share with you an empirical study which my colleague did with 6,000 households. They asked the households, what is from your point of view the acceptable carbon price? And I can tell you this acceptable carbon price from the citizens is not at all, not at all consistent with the prices are required by carbon neutrality. So then the second experiment was the following. We asked the people, so what is your preferred compensation scheme, equal per capita redistribution and, and other things? And then they, they pointed out and highlighted their preferred compensation scheme. And then we asked the question, if your preferred, comp by the way, equal per capita redistribution was the most preferred one. And then we asked the question, if this one is implemented, what would be the, uh, the accepted carbon price? And we see that this was a massive increase of the accepted carbon price, we could say the marginal abatement cost curves. And this, from my point of view, shows that these aspects have to be decided, have to be discussed in the public much more in a much more salient way. Otherwise, we, we, we get stuck in a, in, a, in a debate which is not constructive and which is uh, not very helpful uh, to, to, to convince people that this transformation process is, is not a transformation where the, the poor people or the, the, the people with low income uh, have to pay the, 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 the highest price. Thank you. Thank you, Otmar. I think this is, this is a very important point and then transition smoothly to the second a topic area where I also wanted to talk about uh, other policies, social policies in particular. And before handing to Caroline, I would like to give the opportunity to Kai, who said that he has to leave, unfortunately, at seven o'clock, to uh, to react to what was what was just said on the 
on the consistency and on the on the need to to communicate and I might I might link that with a question in the Q and A. Um, is this in your view, or shouldn't it be more designed as a transformative process in which you know you create the urgency, you 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 manage it as as a really a big big changeover process rather than get lost in the discussions in in, in details on one and the other industry. I mean, I, I probably can pick up the the this um, per capita. Um, um, scheme, um, which I criticized in Parliament last week, um, because in theory it, it sounds absolutely perfect. I, I have no question about it. But again, as uh, Wolfgang Schmidt also said, we need to look at what is possible, what is feasible, what can we introduce quickly. And it is just not possible to, to implement such a scheme where you hand over money to each German regularly on whatever base. Um, because we don't have their, 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 their contact details of everybody. Of course, we can establish that, but it will take a long time. And we don't have that time. So we must start with something else, which is more practical, which we know already. And that's why we as conservatives or Christian Democrats uh, try to uh, tell everybody that, um, that, um, that um, we have, um, uh, that we need to change the, the um, the tax system uh, that we want to reduce the e, the the energy um, what is it the the energy um, um, the feed in yeah. feed in tariff the energy subsidi subsidiary yeah. uh, sub subsidy subsidy um, first place because that increases the electricity price uh, heavily especially for the low income people. And then we can continue with other taxes we have on the energy uh, on the energy sector, and uh, if we do that, uh, that would be much quicker. It would be social social feasible, and uh, I'm pretty much sure there would be not much money left over to hand over then uh, to, to 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 the people um, um, in in such a scheme. The Greens believe is the most feasible. I mean, the 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 the, the, the idea the Greens have is that um, it would result in some kind of subsidy of eight euros per month per, per, per capita, which I think doesn't, um, doesn't justify the huge administrative uh, bureaucracy we have to uh, build up. And that's why we should be more practical and change our tax system. We need a new ecological friendly tax system after the next election. So, yeah, it seems... It seems like this particular issue is more an implementation issue. Yeah, Otmar, I don't want to. T -t Just a, a quick response. And sorry, I just want to say goodbye. Sorry if, that I have to leave, but I hope the discussion goes on uh, well. well. What a pity. I, I agree now with you. So that then you are leaving now. <laughs> no, but in the short term. achieve for tonight. <laughs> Uh, uh, in the short run, I think uh, Kai is right that the financing the EEG umlage. Uh, through the carbon pricing revenues is the, in the short term the most practical thing. And by the way, we did a calculation which shows that in particular the low income household would really benefit. But but when we think about and we have to anticipate carbon prices above 100 euros per ton CO2, so the EEG umlage financing is 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 then definitely not sufficient. So from my point of view, this is a short term and and a long term and a mid term issue. I fully agree. In in the short run, we would be not in a position to organize this uh, this equal per capita recycling, but I don't think we need a huge bureaucracy. So there are some studies here which which shows that that here we could could, could it, it takes time, but therefore in the short run I, I I agree. In the long and in the midterm, I think we have really to think carefully about compensation schemes which are robust um, uh, above the one hundred euros per ton CO two. Yeah. Okay, Caroline, sorry to make you wait, but. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, I would, uh, I would like to refer to, to two items and I will change the order because Kai just provided the, the keyword of uh, taxation. Um, and I think on a, on, a, on a superficial level, we can agree that we, we need a, a profound change uh, of our tax system, which is notoriously inflexible. So there has been very little movement uh, over decades uh, when it comes to the, the question where we actually get uh, uh, get our tax revenues from. And um, 
I would like to to point the uh, the um, attention to the to the uh, um, to what Maya mentioned because most of the subsidies she mentioned, which are uh, env environmentally harmful, are indirect tax subsidies. So this is a, a huge uh, a, a huge levy that we that we have that could be moved rather easily uh, if wanted uh, because it's uh, those are regulations that are already in place and uh, that that could already provide a lot of. Um, uh, a lot of impact when it comes to the political signals towards uh, 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 climate neutrality. So, can you give living, example? Living, uh, of course, of course, we have, uh, for example, the uh, privileges, uh, um, lower taxation for um, for for diesel uh, combustion. Uh, we have privileges when you use a uh, automobile that is financed by your company, the so-called Dienstwagen. Uh, privilege. We have a lot of exemptions when it comes to energy intensive industries. Uh, a, a big, a big portion of the um, of the overall amount is also coming from uh, uh, no taxation at all on, on kerosene. So this is a going over all sectors actually, and uh, there are several several um, regulations that are worth uh, eight eight billion and more per year. So I think that is something that we really need to look at and that does not require like uh, a revolution, <laughs> but a mere change within the existing system. But we also have to go further than that. And um, I wanted also to relate to, to what Otmar said regarding pricing. So at, at first we also uh, a firm supporter of uh, having a price on, uh, on pollutants. Uh, but I think what we also have to look at, and I would like to refer back to what I said initially, uh, regarding standards or pricing, what is better, what is worse, what have we seen in performance in the past, we, we actually have to look at the point where we are at. So both, I think both standards, as well as the emission trading system in the earlier years was uh, compromised by, uh, by lobbying interests. And we have, uh, well, we have had a very poor performance of the emission trading system as well in its earlier years. So we, we know the, the, the perils and we have to attack those. And that's why I think we need a very, very clear signal from the political side that the time of discussing the if is over. It's now about the how. And because the question is, it's, it's, it's existential actually. It's, uh, it's, it's not about, uh, of course, it's always at the end about the euro more, the euro less, but, but this is really the, the, the way forward is un, unquestionable. And, uh, our our highest court has uh, has supported that recently, so I think that that is a that's a very clear signal. And I would actually like to. I mean, there's a lot of energy in this discussion, and I would like to see it uh, uh, shift towards more creativity. Creativity when it comes to un unleashing uh, funding questions. Uh, I think our green bonds, Wolfgang may know better about that, are quite successful. So what else can we do and how can we get the dynamics into the system by providing clear signals, clear framework, including the, the, the planning issues? I'm totally with you there. But when we stick with, uh, with the fiscal policies, I think there are a lot of, a lot of instruments that are not even yet discussed uh, enough. And I think this is, this is a good point to play it back to the active policymaker, Wolfgang. Uh, who basically has probably very informed what the discussion is on these subsidies and also to Otto because the FTP, if it were in government, what, you know, what would it do different to these ends? But maybe we give the floor to Otto because he was uh, only active once and I was quite um, generous with your time. And after Otto, I will jump in. Oh, no, welcome, welcome. Don't go, I, I'm not going to let you out of this. This is where I really first want to see what the government is going to do. Come on. Okay, so on, on the subsidy thing, I think, um, yes, it, 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 we have to tackle this. And, and, and here this ministry does a report uh, every year on subsidies. But um, I also do remember in 2002, a discussion on the VAT and what kind of exceptions we should have when Hans Eichel, the then finance minister, started such a debate. And then at the end, I think we changed two things or something like that. Because the, the problem is behind every subsidy, there is a group of people who thinks that is absolutely needed. And, and, and for example, the commuter um, 
subsidy. So a tax deduction for commuters, which is actually not only for those who drive a car, but also a bicycle or, or, or commute by train. Obviously, it's a lot of money. But if we discuss, for example, higher CO2 prices, and we also have an idea about an average of um, normal income people, then among the group of average normal people, there are commuters who live 22, 25 um, kilometers away from their work, and so if we cut that subsidy because it's 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 so climate unfriendly, then what do we tell these people? And then also your your per capita um, reimbursement for um, the the CO two pricing won't work. On average, it works, but for the commuter, it doesn't. For the person living in a house where he or she cannot change the heating system. So again, the proof of the pudding is in the eating and and, and this pudding is, is not very good to eat, I think. And so I, I like this idea and, and, and I know that many people always put the 50 billions of climate unfriendly subsidies uh, in the window, but, but then let's go through each of them, and let's have the political discussion. I'm I'm pretty sure that we will have it um, uh, in the in the next in the next term. Otto, what will you do? Well, first, agree with most points with Wolfgang, and um, because it's exactly what the problem for us policymakers is, and that's what I said in the beginning. Uh, it's a little bit. There's this Goethe saying: "Halb zog es ihn, halb sank er hin." Um, half he was torn, half he went down. And this is how you have to do politics at the end. And yes, in politics, we do agree the necessity of, 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 of really stopping and not getting to the point where we can't stop anymore. But to take people with us, we, you have to find the, these middle measures. And again, I don't agree that the tax system didn't change in the past. I'm a budget guy. I know the numbers. If I do see how the VAT rate really took a larger pillar every year in the last 25 years, you can see that it's changed. The problem that we do have in our tax system is that we want justice and we do this by exceptions. And when exceptions then hit us to be unfair again, we need another justice regulation. This is how things work. And I give you an example. The, the, the highest subsidies, when you take the just the, the, what, two days or the one day old draft of the budget 2022, where you find the list. It's mostly because of energy. And why is it because of energy? Because in the idea of, of using EEG, as uh, Otmar Inkova said, to, to really have investment in that area, prices got too high. And so we had the, the highly energy intensive companies that needed to get a subsidy because we find it unfair on the other side. And that is why I think that the EEG has another advantage to, to get rid of it because then some of those subsidy goes away. The next subsidy that Caroline uh, told us about the Dienstwagen and everything. Yeah, but on the other side, the majority of full electric cars is coming because of this regulation and because the government said we give them special tax redemptions if they take full electricity cars. So what we have to do, and I agree, is to get rid of those who are uh, tax exemptions or subsidies of the past and as, as last as possible, do, do new ones. Because and that is what but nobody has said, and then I'm going to stop because I have to go to vote in, in 10 minutes, is always keep in mind, the more money you give to the budget, the more you give the power to people like me to decide where the money is going to. If you leave it to the market and tell the market what the goals have to be, it's different, it's competition. And once again, I, I really have to say that, Transformation needs money. And even if, if, if the public sector does a lot, and, and just you know what, just give companies enough possibility to take money from the market, to say, I need a loan, I need maybe 1 billion to, to do the investment that is necessary for the next 20 years. They probably invest faster than Wolfgang ever could do, even if he could harm uh, the Ministry of Transportation, Economy or others to do things the right way. Okay. I see, I see Maya has her hand up. Is it still up to date? Otherwise I would also like to give Lisa the floor because I guess you also have to run to the vote. Mm. Um, but I, Maya, maybe first. Just a, a few, just quick uh, things that Otto's in particular remarks just raised with me. Um, 
I think it is really important. I would really love this to see this, like where's the transparency about the distribution of effects, both on ecological and social from what we have in place in taxation, and then say, how can we make a package from it to make sure that we are really correcting for both of those? Because we have a lot of trickle up. I think it's been documented really well by Sebastian Bach, for example, from the DIW, that we do have other issues that are really eating into people's uh, feeling of, I am secure with my household budget. And most and foremost, we've been discussing recently is rent. So we're spending a lot, we're forcing people to spend a lot of money on rent. And then obviously they don't have a lot of money for other things. So unless we're correcting also for additional pressures on the household budget, budget, we can't expect from climate policy or environmental policy to kind of pick up all of those pieces that are already pushing us into um, the direction of, of yeah, social injustice and precariousness and feelings of fear. Um, so I do think this packaging, the social and the environment is, is really, really important because we can't expect for environmental policy to correct all of that as well. And this is why I'm totally with you on the VAT. It's a really socially degressive way of taxing consumption, but there are loads and loads of ideas of how you could do it socially progressive when you're really shifting more onto the consumption of resources. And that's one of the effects that Otmar and others have been doing on the CO2 because the footprint sizes are different. And then you can still find solutions for the ones that are really hard hit, but those are really a small group. So the general pattern of having less money and having less expenditure on especially mobility and size of flats, both mobility in terms of travel for work, but also for leisure. When you look at the distribution of um, expenditures on energy and uh, thus CO2, that really, really is the change when you look about the size of the household budget. So it is luxury emissions, basically, that are being hit hardest, and then it is beneficial for the household. So when we really look at shifting more and more, I think this is where Caroline was going, onto taxation of the consumption of resources, we might have a nice fit in quite a lot of those spaces, not only in the CO2, if we do the instruments right. So yes, out of the socially degressive uh, consumption taxes into socially progressive ones and environmentally effective ones, really be transparent on what else is there. And then um, I would also ask us to think about where can market forces really work and where are they hampered? Because in a lot of places we don't really have market forces right now because we have oligopolies and we have places that are not really <laughs> transmitting the market signals fast enough because we have kill zones around gigantic IT companies. We do have giant investors now buying up the social uh, or the infrastructures for living in, in our cities. So there's not much of a market idea in quite a lot of the sectors that are really important. So how do we make sure that market forces can actually play out and get out of what jo Robert Solo talked about, feudalistic or plutocratic systems and then we're still thinking about the market can do its magic, but it's not actually a, even a market structure we're looking at. And I think we have to be honest yeah. in that one as well. I think, Maya, you have to uh, leave a little moment for Otto and Lisa to re respond to that. I, I weave in the question also from the audience, like why actually is the consumer supposed to pay for this? Isn't it the, shouldn't it be the industry and the, the political side who in the first place polluted the climate? It's a very provocative question. But then they're going to then the user is going to pay at the end too because the products are getting more expensive. That is not the term because then you get subsidies for buying the products from the industry that had to pay more because. So at the end, it's a circle. Yeah, well, that depends. That depends, of course, uh, of uh, you know, the, the the possibility of the industry to really overrule all the costs or or not and this uh, depends on the product and so on this is yeah we'll see uh, how that will, will go um i but if uh, they don't overrule, if they don't overrule what will happen with with these companies then they yeah, just maybe, make... maybe they go insolvent if they are not able to adjust you know, or to to go into productivity or so on you know the the the, the, the production um, circle so, so they go insolvent, then we have just a monopoly or an oligopoly. No, we have well. not. We, uh, no, this also depends on the regulator. No? What kind of market do you then have uh, in which way competition will still take place? I just want to say that it's not this simple thing that uh, it's always uh, it's always possible just to overrule to the uh, to the uh, to the consumer. No? Um, of, this is a good thing that we believe in the innovation of the market society and all the markets and that we have competition and therefore we use the market and the competition for the transformation. And that means um, that 
this is not so I that so um, uh, so 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 one one sided as you say it. The only thing I wanted to say is that um, 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 I go do not really go for the argument. Uh, we do the EEG um, uh, reduction uh, in the in the in the short run, and then later on we change into the uh, energy money. Um, because um, it is true that also the reduction of the, um, and it's not a taxation actually, no? um, Caroline Chino told about the other uh, tax subsidies we really do have around this 50 billions and uh, Bocker Schmidt and Otto Fricke did not really like to talk about, but the EEG umlage is not a taxation. The EEG umlage is, uh, is a different mechanism no? for, for financing the, re renew the renewable energies in Germany. And uh, it's true that, of course, um, it also has a positive impact uh, also for uh, smaller house households. But the truth is that, and no, you have it in your numbers, Mr. Edenhofer, um, that um, the energy money is more distributive than the EEG. And the EEG reduction, of course, um, um, helps more the industry, the proportion, no, how the indus industry uh, gains on that and how the private household gains on that is different to the system when you do it by energy money. And the point is that, um, of course, you want, once have these uh, set up administration costs, but we did do hard reforms in Germany within months. And so I do not really buy the, the argument we can't do that because uh, we can't do things in some, in some months. We did Corona in some months no, with some trouble, but uh, this I think is not the argument, but behind this, shown argument that it's maybe a little bit complicated is the real uh, political debate about what distributional effects do you want to have and what are the interest groups you um, you go for election for. Okay, can we, since we have only a couple of minutes left, um, transition to the last kind of topic area, which is the international environment. So from the Q&A, somebody correctly remarked that China is going to be the biggest polluter. And Germany actually, you know, in, in the, from a global point of view, the share of pollution coming from Germany is not that big. So how should we actually deal with the challenge that the others around us have to basically also join us in this effort? Maybe there the perspective would be very interesting, both from the experts and the active policymakers. And of course, Lisa and Otto, if you can still stay on for a moment, would be great. Who wants to take that first? I mean, Otto and, and Lisa. I, I make sure you know, first, really, Lisa and I have to vote till till uh, thirty eight minutes past seven, and otherwise we have to pay for that. That is that is which many people don't know. But if we don't do our work, we really did that. things get back. International level. The interesting thing is, if we look at environmental politics, um, it's quite weird. But Genscher in the seventies had the idea; he was the first one who built up the first part in, in, in one, one of the ministries. Then we lost. Then in the 80s, we got stronger. Um, we were the role model, even on a low level in Europe and now the other companies followed. So here again, if we are front runners in the world, we have to show that it works. If it doesn't work, then we really get into big problem. And that is why, why that I think is what Wolfgang also said. At the end, take the people with you also means take people from other countries with you. They want to see that there is a country where CO, where carbon dioxide reduction works and still the life is good. If they don't see that, they don't follow. If other governments have to get the question, why can't we have what the Germans have, then it'll work. And here, that is really, I don't have the complete answer for that, but this is, this is how it has to work. So as I always do say, be a step ahead, admit that you're not completely perfect, but tell others that life is not bad when you do something for the environment. Caroline, can I take you, unless Lisa, you want to have your final <laughs> thought on this? Thank yeah. you, Otto. Thank you, thank you, Jochen. Um, I, I wanted uh, to refer, especially to the to the China question, because uh, of course it is right that when it comes to total amounts of emissions, uh, uh, not a lot effect uh, can happen without China. 
uh, but I happen to have some China experience. I've uh, been working there commercially, uh, visiting and auditing factories, and I've also done government corporations there. And be not mistaken, they are looking precisely at every detail that we do, but they will not just come copy it. So I, I, I think I went to China three or four weeks after the Coal Commission finished their work. And they had already translated and understood everything that was in that paper, but they will certainly not copy that insane amount of compensation uh, because, uh, well, first they <laughs> don't want to, and second, um, they they uh, they have to have a different kind of transformation uh, sales story if you want to the public. But it, it's uh, when it's always being mentioned that well, Germany only has two percent of global emissions, and it doesn't matter what we do here. That's totally not true, and that's why I said initially we have to be. Uh, uh, credible and we have to act decisive and we also have to take care when it comes of sort of looking out of Germany, looking into uh, to, uh, at the entire world, have to take care that um, countries who don't have that much self potential, they don't have that strong finances, etc. They are not that they, they are not left behind. So this is, of course, a big task and that cannot be fulfilled by Germany alone. Um, but uh, yeah. it certainly matters what we do uh, uh, internationally. And um, I wanted to provide one comment to Otto. He's uh, left now too. Um, when it, uh, I think he, the, the picture he painted is right to say, how, how, can we, how can we have an example that is worth copying that others also want to have? But uh, I think we also have uh, to lead the pack there when it comes to the understanding of what is a good life? And we are already struggling in, uh, in, in Northwestern Germany uh, with uh, deterioration of, of drinking water quality due to um, uh, uh, over, uh, what's the word? E excessive... Um, uh, <laughs> All the pollution. <laughs> yeah, nitrate uh, introduction. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. yes. Uh, so excessive, okay. excessive pollution, and, so, and we're also seeing other effects. So uh, that 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 is uh, providing negative impacts on our living quality. And this is this is just a, a superficial start. The other one is also when it comes to um, uh, well to the overall connotation of, of of what is a good life. And I think that cannot only be measured in in GDP data. Yeah. So we, we are running out of time. So we have basically two minutes left and I would like to give uh, each of you so the, the floor once and each of the remaining speakers. So maybe in the, in the order of, of uh, Otmar, Maya and Wolfgang, um, you have very quick uh, thoughts on this international dimension. Yeah, very quick. First of all, uh, climate policy is welfare enhancing. That's the most important thing. And this is why China in the end is interested in climate policy because they are very much impacted by the climate damages. So this is a statement one and one. Secondly, definitely we need international cooperation and the European Union and Germany has to invest a lot of political capital to make this happen. One practical proposal would be to form a climate club. Climate clubs are from my point of view very important and they are now feasible because uh, US and China are also committed to carbon neutrality. We know this is a hard, a hard thing to do, but it is possible. Within this club, they should agree on minimum carbon prices, and they should basically impose some kind of CBAM outside the club. This would have a very strong impact on the other people. And uh, the most important thing is we should set up an investment fund where we help the smaller South Asian countries uh, to transform their economies because they are inv still investing in coal and when they continue still in uh, uh, their investment in coal so definitely uh, the very ambitious climate protections coal are no longer feasible so in that sense we are very well advised uh, to put a lot of effort and a lot a, a little bit money into the enhance in the enhancement of international cooperation these are good ideas for the policy makers maya mm -hmm. No, I, I also think that when you think about it in terms of which kind of products are going to be needed in the future are the ones that are scalable on a global uh, level. So we have to find those solutions that work. And this was one of the huge success stories, even though we missed out through not quick enough policy adaptation, et cetera, on making the energy transition as successful it could have been here, but it was the most important development policy if you think of rural electrification and other things. So the kind of frugal innovation aspect and the globally um, 
scalable solutions will be key. And I really want us to understand that not acting will not leave us unabated or unaffected. I mean, the whole migration path that we've seen now, there's a lot of forced migration that's going to come our end. And we cannot expect Africa to do or the whole African continent to say, yeah, we're going to shield against people leaving our continent. Why you take our resources and you take the money flows. So either you have a free mobility of war or you're just really going to lose out, especially when China looks into that. That's my last point. If we don't look at efficiency, but also sufficiency of really trying to provide for the things that we need with least resources, geopolitically, we're going to we'll be tiny. So it's a security agenda for Europe to say, how do we make most of everything that we take out of the soil? And that nicely ties into everything we pollute in the air. It is simply sensible to do this, both out of global responsibility point of view, but also out of pure self-interest. Wolfgang, can't you just agree to all of that and implement it in the next yeah, Not, not only months? implementing it in the next phase, we are already doing that. So. Um, I find it quite interesting that actually it's finance ministers that at every meeting, be it G7, be it G20, or be it IMF meetings, discuss climate. And obviously, um, we, we even formed a coalition of finance ministers for climate action, and we've been a founding member and been actively working on it. So on the next G20 uh, meeting in, in Venice, um, we will not only discuss Olaf Schott's proposal on a global minimum taxation, but at the end of the meeting, there's another meeting on, on, on climate. Um, and obviously, there is a, a big issue in, in engaging um, China. Um, Otma mentioned the Climate Club. Olaf brought that to the table at the G7. Um, everybody agreed that this is an absolute necessity. Um, we have a slight problem with the US, even though Janet Yellen, the, the US Secretary of Treasury, uh, I think was one of the first to, to introduce CO2 pricing into the debate also as an economist. Um, the US for political reasons will not have an explicit CO2 price. So how to make the explicit CO2 pricing that we have in Europe or in Canada or in, in, in Great Britain and in Japan um, compatible with the one in an implicit one that the US has. So that is the things that we are actually discussing. And we are then discussing the question of, of, of climate financing. So in Paris, um, the industrialized uh, countries um, agreed that they would provide $100 billion um, dollars annually um, for um, uh, developing countries um, to fight climate change. Uh, Germany has been a leader. We doubled our efforts to four billion. We now said, okay, we are ready to even increase more. Actually, the budget we just approved yesterday in cabinet had an increase of uh, half a billion uh, euro, and we're going to reach six billion, only state money. And now we're discussing together, um, also at the IMF, how the SDR allocation, so new money um, for central banks, 650 billion euro, can be, can be used also to, to, to fight climate change. So there's a lot of things going on. And 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 Caroline mentioned uh, green bonds. We have a, a sustainable finance strategy now. Um, we issued um, a 30-year green bond. I think it was six times um, over um, subscribed. So there is things happening. And, and really, at every meeting of finance ministers, my colleagues, um, the deputies, we are discussing climate financing. How do you do the climate fi uh, pricing? So it's happening. And, 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 and we will have the G7 presidency next year. And if, if all of were to continue, probably eliminating the vice in the chancellor title, um, he would put um, the, the climate club um, as, as one of the priorities, because this is what we need to do to avoid trade tensions or even trade wars and to include China with all the difficulties we have with them. Dear panelists, we ran out, out of time. This is a very exciting discussion, which we can continue. I think we, we heard uh, about many, many interesting aspects here. And I think this debate needs to be carried out further in the public for, uh, for the better understanding of, of what this all takes. Thank you very much for being part of this event. Um, this video will be available on Herty's uh, YouTube uh, channel. And I wish everybody a very nice evening. Thank you for staying with us.